Salams, this is Newsclick and uh, Playthings of Alien Forces. Uh, we have reassembled after a break of uh, many weeks where, where I think all of us were looking at other aspects of our, uh, I don't know, lives and careers and other such things. Uh, but we're back. Uh, we're back, of course, in the midst of uh, a war in Europe, uh, Russia and Ukraine uh, currently engaged in, in a military conflict that has uh, grown from a limited sort of theater specific conflict into one uh, that has included large parts of the world and is impacting perhaps all of it, including us uh, here in India, whether it's in terms of uh, fuel prices or uh, other essential uh, products, trade, uh, energy, uh, and other such things. Uh, over the course of the weeks of this, uh, this, this conflict, this war, we found that increasingly sport has become a topic of conversation or another front on which at least the economic side of this war is being played out. Uh, a lot of pressure being exerted uh, by the West, the US, uh, Europe, and uh, NATO and, and their allies, uh, including widespread bans on Russian athletes, not just teams representing Russia, but also individual athletes who happen to come from uh, that country or carry that passport, uh, were born there, perhaps live and train there. Uh, to discuss the merits and demerits of uh, and the politics, of course, of these sporting bans. Uh, we have with us senior veteran journalists today, sports journalists who have covered uh, a vast range of sports, uh, multidisciplinary sports, uh, motorsports, cricket, football, uh, the Olympic Games, uh, and other such. Uh, Leslie Xavier, New Street Sports Editor, of course, and Sharda Ugra uh, are both with us. Uh, first of all, guys, and I'll start with you, Sharda, your, your uh, understanding of how uh, the politics of these bans or the logic with which they are employed. Uh, what does history tell us about how this has happened and, and have they had the kind of effect that is desired? Um, you know, these bans that are there, uh, they come along at very selective times uh, because the international uh, press is largely English speaking, Western dominated, the press with the money and the media with the money and the and, and, and the influence and the almost like the cachet of running the sort of mental outlook of what the world thinks it should be like. Uh, right. So you have these things taking place, uh, these sanctions imposed. I remember in the 80s, uh, it was so hard to get sanctions to be imposed on South Africa until very, very late, you know, so that the voices that were protesting against the apartheid movement came from the non-Western countries, the non-Caucasian countries, if I can use the phrase. Uh, yeah. And and to get India that and voice... Was leading that push. Yes, yes. And to get that voice heard, it's like you were, you know, shouting into a void at some point. Whereas now uh, you're seeing that it's, you know, it was uh, in what was a practice that was so reprehensible and so abominable, it took so long to budge. Um, uh, and it was sport that actually did kind of make the final push. I don't think that sport, Mr. Putin is going to worry about his athletes not competing. It will just kind of get everybody's backs up. So you have to uh, uh, look at it uh, in, in, in several ways, you know. Uh, there is a war that is being fought and uh, and uh, uh, a trauma that the ukrainians and, uh, and uh, that are go that are going through including the athletes that are there among them those who have decided to take up arms that's all very valid but the sanctions i think it's almost a uh, I, I dare i say it's a token gesture because it's not like uh, europe is stopping oil and gas or britain is stopping oil and gas coming from there it's not like uh, you know there hasn't been sanctions where it hits it's the easiest people to to go after are uh, the athletes, uh, athletes, singers, artists, musicians, you know, they're the simplest, they're the softest touches in many ways. Yeah, yeah. Le Leslie, do you also uh, see it as, as mere tokenism or is it like slightly more even sinister than that, that if you want to sort of participate in and partake of uh, the wealth and the fame that comes with being part of the, the global uh, sporting circus, then you must also uh, either remain politically absolutely neutral. In, in this case, also the demands being made are not just neutrality, but outright sort of they are asking for these athletes to outright uh, decry or denounce their own country and uh, literally uh, choose the side of uh, the opposition. I mean, how, how is that a realistic 
expectation to have on individuals so uh, the uh, realistic expectations so not apart if you look at for instance the ban by wimbledon on russian and belarusian players i mean rublev who had clearly sent out a message against the war he has been banned so it's a blanket ban so what what does the athlete have to do now he has to i mean be completely denounce his own country and step out of the country and uh, uh, be a player without without a nation and then compete i mean that doesn't work like that right so there is a, a huge level of hypocrisy happening in this ban politics in this in this game of bans mm -hmm. and it is every day it, it 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 has various layers to it as well so uh, even when sharda said about about the selective nature of this ban it is i mean uh, we have discussed this pre previously as well that uh, the conflict that is happening in ukraine is not a, not the only conflict that is happening across the world in the past 20 30 years if you look at it there have been wars that have been waged uh, the gulf wars the two gulf wars the the uh, continuous conflict and violations of human rights that happened in in uh, israel palestine and uh, saudi uh, saudi's uh, actions in yemen so uh, many many other issues in africa syria conflict so and we all know which all nations are part of the, part of those conflicts uh, usa has a prominent role in many of these conflicts and uh, yeah. britain have had its yeah. its own role yeah. so so by that measure no american athlete or no british athlete or no israeli athlete should be allowed to compete in any of these global competitions so but 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 then the outrage came out now and it's also a very con concerted effort to push uh, so the so the politics that we play by play behind it, it goes beyond just the claim that it is to stop uh, russia and putin's uh, avenue for a propaganda that is sport uh, it, it 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 has everything to do with the the global the west and their mechanism to to push back some kind of an opposition they are facing Uh, in in their game, in their game to control the world and the politics and the economics that is there. So, uh, the if you ask me, what is the sinister goal behind it? What sort of uh, purpose does it uh, does it serve? It doesn't obviously it doesn't serve the purpose of uh, finding a resolution to the conflict as such. I mean, these athletes yeah. who are, in, who are, in, in some ways it, it's kind of just just pushing uh, for. a further escalation on a different front as well instead of like on the one hand you talk of and you, or you make statements yeah. of how sport is meant to unite and bring people together and sport is a platform for peace and all of that and then on the other hand you go go ahead and and uh, sort of unilaterally uh, in fact ban people I, from competing so exactly so, so on yeah so, so on one side you are saying that it is to stop sport being used as a propaganda but then on the other hand you are using sport to wield the sport, uh, the soft power and attack attack the other party so it's and also you are actually affecting the lives livelihood and careers of athletes who has no clear say or role in this in this conflict so they i mean uh, in all the countries if you look at it at least don't have a say whether the country is going to war or not going to war and when they have had a say like for instance long back uh, during the vietnam war uh, mohammad ali came out uh, i mean he was a world champion then and he came out against the war and he spoke out and he lost years from his career he was he was incarcerated for that so that is the and we are talking about usa who is the vanguard for freedom and freedom. Uh, individual liberty and freedom. individual liberty and all these things so when that has happened in the us and it has taught us lessons and you are expecting russian athletes to come out and speak and uh, face whatever the repercussions that come from it and i'm not just talking about jail or other whatever the law that is prevailing in that country i'm also talking about alienation because you are part of the country and you are part of a society and then you are standing and speaking against your own countrymen that would alienate these these athletes also and you can't you can't just expect these athletes to do that and if they do do that come and do that that's their own personal choice so we shouldn't be imposing it on them
so that's mm -hmm. that's that's a larger discussion that we should be having as well yeah yeah sharda uh, both of you actually what do you make of the stand that uh, i Leslie was mentioning the case of uh, uh, this Andrei uh, Rublev and his uh, winning the Serbia Open, but then not being able to play Wimbledon up next. Uh, despite beating the world champion, he's won three tournaments this year, which puts him, I think, makes him in the men's tennis game the most successful guy this year next to Nadal. So, obviously, someone who's on top of his game in with a shot of winning the competition. These bans also, of course, uh, detract from the very systems that uh, largely they, these are Western driven uh, professional tours, uh, at television events, etc. etc. Wimbledon is called the championships uh, and it's played in London, uh, but the whole world watches it and it's, it's the, perhaps one of the most widely watched tennis events in the world. Uh, some of the shine of that tournament goes away when, when so you're hitting. Uh, yourself as well. So, what is the logic actually? I mean, is if any, and what do you make of what like bodies like the the International Olympic Committee, for example, what their stand has been on on? I think the, the most interesting thing that's uh, happened with this is the, been the response of the two tours, the men's tour and the women's tour, to say that this is unacceptable. And uh, there was a new story that went out. I don't know whether that's uh, been finalized. Whether it's happened, they met. Uh, to decide whether to take points off. Let's say we won't give you points for Wimbledon because it's a tournament in which uh, the merit that uh, brings players into the tournament based on the rankings that we have is what uh, decides uh, uh, the event. And if you don't have uh, ranking points, then it just becomes an exhibition event. And so if that goes through, it'll be a genuine, a real pushback against this kind of, uh, you know, the use of the athlete as a propaganda tool uh, like Leslie said, to counter what you're saying is the propaganda tool of of the Russian state as such. So yeah. uh, if that comes through, it'll be a it'll be a very big uh, it'll be a very big step. Um, and uh, I think in a way that it'll also mean, uh, for example, that those two tours have distanced themselves because it's a, it's it's the it's the tennis players who run the tour. Mm. Uh, they have said, look, this is the stand we wish to take. I do hope it comes through because the. IOC tends to be, oh, we are all about individual IOC members and we're a family and all, and it's run by the I mean, the countries that are behind it. Uh, I feel the Wimbledon um, ban has come about with perhaps a lot of pressure or a lot of conversation from the British Foreign Office because the minister, sports minister said those things, yeah. you know, uh, that uh, you have to say you are against Putin and whatever. And all. I mean, I don't think every, every British football player is a fan of Boris Johnson, you know. So, uh, um, and his policies, for example, you have to ask Marcus Rashford what he thinks about uh, about yeah. the government at the moment. So, um, uh, to my mind, it's it, it, uh, I would like to see what happens with reference to whether the athletes can actually get some of this back. In the Olympics, it'd be very tough to do because it becomes a big sort of, you know, rara, we, you will compete with. I mean, the poor athletes, the Russians, they are not allowed to have their country's flag next to their uh, image. They, their anthem is not played. Their country's name is not taken. I said, how much mm. more do you want to punish them? Yeah. You know, these are young people. So, uh, like Leslie said, who have nothing to do with the war. They, they haven't been responsible for starting it and they don't going to be responsible for ending it as well. You know, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, we have ATP. to... Sorry, go on. No, ATP and WTA stands and... In that in that regard, because they also had removed the flags from the ranking uh, yes. list and all this. So, uh, but as far as professional sport is concerned, uh, not just not just tennis. You you have uh, boxing, you have uh, UFC. So in all this, uh, you have NFL. In fact, the Russian players are still playing in the US. So uh, in all these areas, sport takes this precedence. The business of sport takes precedence as well. So. We have Russian fighters fighting for the title and well as well. So, in that regard, ATP will add a clear deal with Wimbledon or any tournament organizer. The entry criteria is, is ranking point, and if you discriminate with the country, that's that's actually a breach of contract. So, they are mulling action. They are uh, not. I mean, yeah, of course, considering the station and history of the tournament, there wouldn't be out, outright removal or anything of that sort. But uh, docking of ranking points is a real. Uh, uh, Scenario. It's not been decided yet, so they are discussing that as such. So, but but the larger point is that professional athletes again still have some sort of respite, but it's not the same for 
Olympic athletes. It's not the same for amateur athletes, the young mm -hmm. athletes coming up and all that. So you are basically cutting that uh, route which which enables these. And uh, you are talking about Russia, Russian athletes who are again considered medal prospects in when when Olympic comes around, for instance, or any global event as such. So you are basically attacking those athletes and taking away their chances and not just this current generation of athletes, but also uh, uh, L, I mean, two, three generations would be affected as that. So this is a uh, larger attack on on sport as such and sporting bodies don't realize it in the in the politics. They lose that lose that plot, lose that idea. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, if anything, uh, on the face of it, this should be exactly the kind of thing that the IOC responds to by saying, hey, this is government interference in the functioning of sport. We will Correct. not stand for it. Correct. Clearly, this is, uh, but, but somehow that's not how it plays out. Interestingly, the NHL, the National Hockey League in the US, which is perhaps the professional sporting league that involves the maximum number of Russians, ice hockey uh, being, uh, I think, perhaps the biggest sport in Russia, if not up there at least. Uh, and uh, I think people will remember in the late 80s and 90s, uh, Slava Fetisov actually, who is the current sports minister in Putin's government, was among the first uh, Russian ice hockey players to get over the bar barriers that then existed and be allowed to play professional sport in the US. Now, of course, he's also on the sanctions list. Uh, but interestingly enough, the NHL has not taken any decision, nor is it contemplating any kind of ban on Russian players. So when the NHL draft happens later on, Russians will be drafted. And of course, existing players who are playing for various NHL teams will continue to play there. Uh, so, so it's interesting how where the, there is an impact, a clear impact. And uh, some of these Russian players are the best in, in their teams, in their league, uh, and draw thousands of, of, of you know television and live uh, in the flesh, stadium audiences, they sell shirts, etc., etc. So interesting that, that the ban doesn't extend to those guys. Uh, but lots of interesting things. In an Indian context, I want to ask you guys, uh, and this perhaps can we can then wind up this little conversation. I had the opportunity to hang out over the last couple of months uh, with a few. And of course, it started out with confusion, lots of questions, you know, like what should we think about this? Uh, because uh, India also has a very special relationship, historical relationship with Russia. And even though there may be uh, on the streets very little understanding of the conflict between uh, Ukraine and Russia in this case, but there is not the kind of blanket villainization of everything Russian that perhaps uh, exists in Western culture, popular culture. Um, what, have you guys uh, spoken to the any part of the Indian sports fraternity, um, whether it's journalists or, or athletes, uh, and, and what, what is their kind of take on uh, the bans and where we stand vis-a-vis -vis the war? I mean, of course, it's not that we need to be in a position to, in, in any case, take sides. I think it should be uh, without any, this thing that like, no war is a good war and is anything that any of us support. But, but what are what is the what is the sentiment in general in the sporting fraternity here? Uh, generally, I would see again uh, the the voices against war and against the conflicts is, is is prominent here. But as far as the ban is concerned, I, I don't think anybody I mean anybody that I have come across I have spoken to uh, support support these kind of moves. So because it is a double edged sword uh, sword always and. Uh, these bans doesn't serve anybody's purpose. At the same time, it also brings down, brings the distribute to sport and to the competing nations as well. So that's why someone like a Djokovic who has come out against uh, speaking against the ban, he, he says that uh, you are, I mean, of course, he, he is one of his, I mean, two of his strongest rivals have been banned. So uh, he feels that even if he wins, the tournament, it would the achievement would be belittled by the fact that it was a depleted uh, tournament as such. The same thing with uh, I mean, if you look at uh, India, the Indian football team played Belarus, a friendly match, and that was within the rule because that, that's allowed as well. Uh, you can play in a neutral venue friendly match, and so 
it was not against that pre uh, prevalent blanket ban by FIFA that uh, that would stop Belarus from playing in FIFA tournaments and all that. It was a friendly, yeah. and they played. So the fact that India was willing to play a friendly uh, with uh, with Belarus kind of shows where our politics as well as the sporting mechanism stands as far as the band is concerned. We look at, we have always stood, stood our, so as Sharda mentioned, we were in the forefront when pushing for the apartheid ban, but that, uh, because there was right in it. And I believe Indian football team playing Belarus is also us standing for what is right and ethical as far as uh, sport is concerned. So in that, uh, in that regard, we have always, I mean, India as a country has always stood stood our ground, uh, ground as far as doing what seems to be the right move. Of course, these things can change because global politics and push and business and all these are intertwined in a big mess. So if, if, when push comes to shove, everything, everybody steps back. But yeah. Russia-India relations have always been so on a on a popular front, if you ask me, uh, it's it's very difficult to demonize Russia because Russia has always been an ally for India, historically speaking. And there have been cultural exchanges, there have been understanding like that. So, so uh, yeah, so that's, that's, that's what the predominant emotion that I have felt speaking to people in the fraternity with sports persons. So, Shada, last word from, from you and then we wrap this yeah, up. Yeah, I mean, I, I uh, agree pretty much with what Leslie said with whatever conversations is. The idea of sporting bans kind of hits people and they don't like the idea of it and for reasons that are not doping, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So you see, mm -hmm. this it doesn't make any sense because there's nobody involved. I think what's also interesting, I remember with reference to Belarus is that there was an anti-athlete protest against the president of uh, uh, Belarus the last time. They went to jail as well. You know, I think if you need your athletes to be inspired by what uh, they, they, they see as their power and their responsibility, the athletes of Belarus actually show the world a lot of it by signing this letter. There were thousands. I mean, some of them were in jail. Uh, so, you know, I think uh, because of the fact that we have the president of having a you know, Russians love their children too, that song uh, that Sting had to produce. So we always knew that because we grew up uh, surrounded by this exchange with the Russians and so on. So there is a de definitely there's a certain a a a anger at the fact that the these athletes are being targeted for, for, for whatever, uh, for absolutely no excuse at all. Yeah, fair enough. All right. Thank you both for your time this afternoon. Uh, for those of you who are listening to us, uh, this is Playthings of Alien Forces. You can catch us and get more details on these and other stories from our website, newsclick.in. Uh, also, we will now be available on Spotify as a podcast. Or oh, not just Spotify, actually, on wherever you get your podcast. So whether it's Google or Apple or Spotify or wherever it might be. So check us out there. Uh, follow us and we will be coming to you uh, from now on, uh, hopefully, at least once a week with conversations from around the sporting world with a particular focus, of course, on what's happening in India. Uh, yep, this has been a new presentation. Thanks very much. Goodbye.